Alright, this is John Cull of OKRaw.com. Today we have another exciting episode for you. In this episode, we're going to do a Q&A. Got a whole bunch of questions and I have a whole bunch of answers, hopefully, that I'll be sharing with you guys on this topic. Unfortunately, there's one of me and I have a lot of subscribers on my different channels now. So I apologize, I can't possibly respond to everybody that asked me a question underneath the video or through any kind of social media outlet should you message me there. Uh, the way that you can get me a question so that I can answer it is... On my community tab, I'll post a link in the description below to my community tab, but if you just go to my uh, channel page, OK Raw, click community, there's a little tab, and then, you know, submit the question right there, and it may show up in next month's Q&A. Now, to let you guys know, first off, is I have been into eating a raw food, plant-based diet, 99% plus since 1995, so I've been doing this quite a long time, more than most people that are making YouTube videos on this topic. I've been around the ringer, I've been around the block, and I've also learned a lot. I read literally like scientific articles all the time, plus apply the knowledge that I've learned through experience, but also doing and also more importantly meeting so many other people doing this diet and trying to dial in my diet so that I do it the best, and that is the information that I'll be sharing with you guys today. All right, so uh, off to the questions. First question is from Molly Joy. What are your top five fruits or veggies to ferment? All right, so... I guess number one is anything I'm growing in my garden is fair game to ferment, especially if I have abundance of it. So recently I did an episode with fermenting radishes, right? Harvested radishes. That's on my Growing Your Greens channel. You can see the process. I, harvest, I, I harvested and fermented peppers, both some hot peppers and sweet peppers. The hot peppers you could actually just blend up and turn into literally a hot sauce, which is amazing. I love doing uh, peppers, so radishes, peppers, then I'd say cabbage. I love doing my excess cabbage and making a kimchi uh, with it. That's three, four, I'd say sauerkraut. I like doing some, um, you know, pickles sometimes or cucumbers, turning them into pickles. Okra is a really fun one I love to do. I love pickled okra, man. It gets so slimy and funky. And then actually another one I really like that I just did a whole big batch of recently is jicama. Jicama is on sale at my local uh, Mexican market, 20 cents a pound. I bought a bunch of it and I fermented it all into jicama fries, which is totally amazing. Maybe you could check my Instagram for a picture on that. All right. Next question is from Mother Earth Voice. What is the best soil to use to grow microgreens indoors? I don't want to use soil for my outdoor composter because I don't want to bring unwanted bugs inside my home. All right. So I would definitely recommend some kind of bag soil. And I would recommend, um, you know, kind of like a potting soil mix. Now that can get expensive. So you might want to use 100% straight coconut coir. But personally, I wouldn't even use a soil myself. I would use a mat. So they have many different mats. You could do like a coconut uh, fiber mat. You could use a hemp mat or canaf mat or jute mat. Actually, and I prefer the mats over the soil. I find it to be a lot more cleaner, although you, that may restrict you on what you can grow on the mat um, you know, versus in the soil. Seth Forrest, how did you transition to raw diet and how long did it take you? <laughs> All right, Seth. So I started back in 1995. And basically, when I started raw, I didn't like, my goal wasn't to eat raw. My goal was to basically heal myself and build my immune system. So I, I started in 1995 when I started uh, basically juice fasting and juicing. And then I did colon cleansing. And then basically, you know, after I did this colon cleanse and my skin cleared up for the first time in my life, I'm like, I'm not going back to eating cooked foods. And I'm just going cold turkey. So, um, and I had to do it for my health because I almost lost my life when I was younger. So that's what I chose to do. Not that I'd say I'd recommend anybody do that because most people, if they just go cold turkey, they ain't going to survive and they're going to make it from past testimonials and experiences that I've had with people and people going raw. I always recommend a slow and steady pace. So, you know, slow and steady will win the race, whereas, you know, fast until you burn out and then crash and then go back to eating cooked foods or whatever else is not the way to go. So, you know... I did it overnight, basically. I don't recommend that. I would say start off by getting more fruits and vegetables in you however you guys can. Juicing is an excellent way to do that. I mean, I, I juice today like over two gallons um, of green juice, some of the greens from my garden here, as well as a turmeric, ginger, uh, rosemary from my garden, ginseng, and lemon as well. So juicing is an excellent way to get more fruits and vegetables in you and keep them raw. Smoothies or vacuum blended smoothies, another excellent way to do it. Of course, just salads 
and just eating meals of fruit. I try to focus on berries mostly these days and I'd eat a lot of just other fruits like, you know, bananas. I'd rather eat berries than bananas. And luckily where I live, I'm able to source berries for maybe three times, four times the price of bananas. And I'm not a big fan of bananas. Plus I have my homegrown persimmon still that I'm eating, enjoying now in February that are harvested in December. Next question is from Jeffy's Homestead and Garden. I miss juicing big time. Any suggestions for juicing off the grid? Tough to just plug in and juice daily. It's now and then. I hope to hear your comments and how to work more of a raw lifestyle, including juicing while being off grid. Thanks. All right, Zephy. So here's the thing. They have some hand crank juicers. And personally, um, they're a lot of work. And I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of those. You could use it. The one rec I'd recommend is the Z-Star is the, probably the best one. It's a single auger horizontal style. Not Still not a big fan. Instead, what I would do is I would basically get a portable power pack. They have like a 300 watt portable power pack that you could get even a small solar panel that's independent if you have a solar panel system on your house. So this way you could still run a juicer and other small appliances, not a blender because they pull too much. Um, but I'll post a link down below if I remember to a video I made literally where I took this, uh, the juicer and the power pack hiking and of course, on that power pack, you could add in an additional solar panel, which I did not have because I charged it at home. So that way you can charge it up in the sun independently of any kind of other solar thing you guys have going on. And you can just basically plug it in and easily juice with a low wattage juicer, which is easier. You know, hand crank and juice could take a long time. And if you're kind of doing it for fun or you have nothing better to do, that's great. But I don't think you can make a good volume of juice doing it that way without significant amount of work, which would probably be good. <laughs> So that's why I like to use an electric juicer personally myself. Although one day I hope to live off the grid, but I will definitely have, you know, solar panels and have plug-ins so I could plug in all my appliances. All right. So I hope that helps you out. Adrian Scott, I'm having a hard time finding the Nutra Max blender. I went to Walmart and Bed Bath Beyond. I found a Nutra Bullet blender with carafe and single serving smoothie personal blender accessories. Is that the newest version? All right, Adrian. So I'm not sure what you're meaning by Nutra Max blender. I did have a video why I would rather use a $55 blender instead of a $400 Vitamix. I believe that was called the Nutramax, and maybe that's what you're talking about. That video is quite old. That blender is no longer available, and I no longer recommend standard traditional blending in a standard Nutramax, Nutribullet, or even a Vitamix. I recommend vacuum blending, so be sure to look up my videos on that um, really soon. Within the next week or two, there'll be the, uh, the best vacuum blender that I've tested. I'll be offering that the... Uh, blend tech nutrient preserver vacuum blending system and that'll cost under five hundred dollars for the whole set including the blender and everything if you already have a vitamix or blend tech you could just buy the craft package that should cost about three hundred dollars all right la fuente hey john i hope all is good with you and the family would you ever consider eating cooked foods again in your life all right so you know the fact of the matter is i don't eat 100 percent raw <laughs> And never really claim to eat 100% raw. I eat 99% raw. And there are some heat processed foods I eat. I'll put a link down below and I will make an update to that video because I have even included a few more. Although, you know, I'm not sitting there eating cooked food all day. I eat raw food all day and might have one or you know, maybe one thing cooked a day, if that. Sometimes there'll be zero cooked food stuff. But, you know, here's my goal and I'll make a video more on, on, on this discussion topic because it's a whole big expansive topic that it's hard to say in a couple sentences. You know, I, here's the thing. I don't want to feel limited in my raw foods diet. I highly respect raw foods and believe it's very important to eat raw foods. And I'm not just going to eat cooked foods because I can or because I want to or any other reason. I have no cravings for cooked foods. But the reason why I eat some heat processed foods is to get some nutrients and or fiber that I would not get otherwise in my diet that can enhance my diet, not make it worse in my opinion. You know, I'm not going out to eat, you know, I'm not go out, I don't go out and buy things that are heat processed. If I'm going to heat process something, I do it myself and I do it in the best systematic way possible to save the most nutrients and still get the benefits. So, for example, in the video I show, you know, I eat a mushroom powder video down below, you know, foods I eat that aren't raw. I am now heat processing my own mushrooms, which is a lot cheaper than buying a mushroom powder that I don't know their process, you know. Another thing that I might heat process are artichokes. In the video below, once again, 12 things I eat that are, are not raw. I would buy artichoke hearts in glass bottles. Why not heat process your own? You know, another thing I heat is beans. I'll, I'll heat up beans, but then I'll ferment them so that they're now considered alive and then do it that way. 
So my goal is, you know, to if I could eat the food raw, I'm gonna by all means eat it raw. If it's something that you can't eat raw and I believe it to be of significant health benefit, I'm gonna I'm gonna heat process it so that I include it in my diet to gain more phytonutrients and or different fibers that I'm not getting from my raw diet that can be lacking. So, you know, um, so the specific reason why I eat the heat processed foods are for my microbiome or for nutrients that I may not be getting otherwise, um, you know, and that's the only reason I'm going to do it. I'm not, and I eat things plain. So, like, for example, I, I, I will heat process, like, two pounds of mushrooms and then they get chopped up and then added to my salad. The rest of my salad is raw. The mushrooms have to be heat processed, okay? Corn, I bought some corn the other day. Didn't heat process that. I ate it raw. You don't need to cook corn, man. Most everything I eat, like all my greens, I don't need to cook. Although I do have a video where I cook greens for my parents because they won't eat them raw. So, I mean, if you got to cook your greens, eat them raw, do it. I'm going to choose to eat my greens. Actually, these greens I just juiced today. I juiced them. I think juicing is way better than cooking greens, personally, but to each their own. All right, let's move on. <laughs> More Tizana Alzma Sack. Hey, John, any advice for eating a plant-based diet for inflammatory bowel disease sufferers? So I don't have any personal advice. I have friends. Um, I had a friend, Dr. Dave Klein, who, uh, you know, in, is suffered from that and wrote a book to help people with those things. Also, my friend Paul Neeson also had that, and he actually went to a raw plant-based diet uh, to get a healing from that. So what I would say for inflammatory bowel disease sufferers, you know, if it was me, what I would do is I would juice, and I would try to remove as much of the insoluble fiber as possible, but drink as much soluble fiber. This will literally relax the, the inflammation from getting inflamed and try to slowly heal my gut. I would also do lots of probiotic foods as well as, you know, introduce slowly, you know, things like whole fruits and then maybe some softer vegetables over time and just bu basically build myself up so that I can handle and basically uh, heal from the illness. Of course, for me also, it would be very important to not eat the things and not have a toxic environment that's going to help cause that issue whether that's stress from a partner you don't like or get along with or a co-worker or you're not getting enough sleep that's very important to have a balance and it's not just about the diet there's so many other things breathing is so important meditation having a spirituality connection with others having a purpose in life all these things are just so important and you want you to be well-rounded so, and I would focus also on a plant-based diet on phytonutrients. Phytonutrients heal, in my opinion, based on studies I've read. And most, many plant-based diets may not even be that phytonutrient-rich. My goal is to eat something purple every single day with a whole bed of red lettuces, which are technically uh, anthocyanin purple pigments, and also purple kales in this bed. I'm easily able to do that. So, you know, that's very important. Then also, you know, try to not restrict types of fiber. Try to have a wide variety of fiber, different kinds of foods, you know, slowly add them slowly but surely. That's what I would do. Next question is Ryan O'Neill Seaton. Hey John, can you use an air fryer at 118 degrees or some other temperature to dehydrate moringa faster or just in another way, i.e. alternatively? I don't have a dehydrator yet. All right, Ryan, so there's many ways you could dehydrate um, moringa. I'm not aware that air fryers will go down to 118 degrees. If you if it does go down that great low, great, then you can keep it raw. <laughs> that being said, some of the studies that I've seen that the, the lower the temperature you dehydrate, the more antioxidants you lose, but you may retain more enzymes. So what's more important to you, the enzymes or the antioxidants in your dehydrated food? And I'll tell you guys, for me, it ain't about the enzymes in dehydrated food. I'd rather eat fresh foods or sprouts for my enzymes or eat fermented foods for my enzymes. When I'm eating dehydrated food, I want to get the phytonutrients, you know, so even maybe maybe making the temperature a bit higher might be more beneficial because now you have less air blowing across it and less time for the antioxidants to basically oxidize off the food uh, because you're not doing it under vacuum. So the optimal would be like a vacuum dehydrator. Um, you know, I, I think I've seen a couple maybe coming out pretty soon, so I'm keeping in my eye, my eye on that. But yeah, you could surely dehydrate uh, Moringa in an air fryer if it goes that low. And even if it doesn't go that low, you could also put it on a baking pan in the oven with just the pilot light on or at the lowest setting. Maybe leave the door open so it doesn't get too hot. That's another simple way. Most people have ovens. And the other thing is if you live in a place that you're able to grow Moringa, it's probably the tropics, and you could just literally hang it up you know, in like a shade cloth. I wouldn't have a direct sun because sun could oxidize nutrients and it could dry that way. So I've seen places do that as well. Next question is from Officially Busy. Hey John, thanks for sharing so much of your knowledge for so many years. 
You've truly helped me on my journey in becoming the greatest version. I would really love to know if you currently supplement any vitamins, which ones you would recommend supplementing on a raw vegan diet, and the best source of these supplements on the market. Thanks once again for being you. Much love and appreciation. Let's see. So I do supplement. Okay, that being said, my preface to that is my goal is to supplement nutrients that I'm not getting from my diet. My goal is to get all my nutrients from my diet, number one. So don't just think, John said you should take this supplement and, and take it, right? I want you guys to get a well-rounded diet first, right? If you're deficient in some kind of mineral, look up what foods contain zinc, right? Pumpkin seeds or, you know, what foods contain selenium on Google. Brazil nuts. Well, they won't tell you it's Brazil nuts only from Brazil and not other places. But nonetheless, every different food has different levels of, you know, vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. I'll post the link down below if I remember to a video I made on how I eat a vegetable-based raw vegan diet. And I go over all my nutrition levels in that video. And they are insane off the charts. So, you know, I'm getting a lot of my nutrient needs met through there. So that's what I'd recommend, number one. So you need to supplement what you're not getting in your diet, and I don't know your personal diet, and that's what I would do personally. That being said, there are some commonalities of things that you may need to supplement on any diet if you live <laughs> in, these, in this day and age. Number one, B12. We killed out the soil microbes. Food is sterile when you're buying it, and even if you just only eat your homegrown stuff without washing it, I would still, and I do still take a B12 supplement. That's very critical. That's probably the most important nutrient. Next nutrient, especially during these times where you want to have a strong immune system, vitamin D. I mean, I'm sitting here right in the sun right now. The sun's blasting my eyes. And if I'm squinting, that's why. Because sometimes it's clouds to go over the sun. Sometimes it's straight up in my face. But I'm good with that. I don't wear sunglasses. You know, I have natural pigments in my eyes to protect my eyes from the sun. Because I eat carotenoid-rich foods. Like I'm going to have my carrot juice next. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. So vitamin D, very important, especially in the winter time for many people that are in northern climates. Uh, you know, the way to know is to get checked, get your vitamin D levels checked and see if you need it or not. Um, instead of taking a vitamin D supplement, you could opt for maybe eating high vitamin D mushrooms and or going in like a, the proper tanning bed. Some tanning beds can help you create vitamin D. I do red light therapy, which may increase my vitamin D, but I get plenty of sun in my garden. Plus, I actually do supplement at this time some vitamin D. Let's see, other nutrients that you may need, vitamin K2. Are you getting K2 somewhere? You know, our bodies may convert K into K2. Um, you know, I'm not technical on all, all that stuff. Um, but the thing is, you could take a K2 supplement, but I eat natto. If you're not eating natto, you might want to take K2. I don't supplement K2 because I'd rather get it for my food, right? And K2, very important for calcium absorption. Why, you know, some raw food is teeth may demineralize because maybe they're not they're getting the calcium hopefully if they're eating enough greens but they don't have the k2 that works in a synergy with the calcium um i mean those are the those are the main vitamins that i'd probably recommend off the top of my head i mean i want you guys to have a well-rounded diet so that you don't need to supplement your diet with additional vitamins you know i take other nutrients that i don't that that aren't vitamins i may have an upcoming episode on that for you guys. I also take, you know, enzymes and probiotics, which I feel to be very important, and other basically powdered foods for the most part. I try to stay away from actually, um, you know, vitamin supplements technically. I try to get that for my food, and that's why I drink copious amounts of juice, about 70 ounces a day at present time, including a root, uh, you know, my turmeric, ginger, you know, rosemary, ginseng shots, then I do a green juice, and then I do a root juice. So I get a lot of different nutrients in that mix right there, pounding in probably like eight pounds of produce before I even eat anything for the day. Next question is from Alex. Hi, John. Thank you, as always, for the great work you're doing. Please know that it is having truly a positive impact on our life. Plus, we spread the information to our friends and family and really to anyone who will listen. Do you recommend increasing or avoiding consumption of any particular fruits, vegetables, or nuts during pregnancy? Well, having never been pregnant before and having never you know, uh, gotten anybody pregnant to, ha to carry full term. Um, you know, what I'll say is I'm not an expert on this topic. Um, but for me, if I had a partner or a wife that was pregnant, which I hope to happen someday because I want to have kids, but I'm currently single, so that's the, that's a challenge, um, is that I would ensure that they got enough phytonutrients. Very critical. You want enough antioxidant capability in, in the mama's body and also the, for the baby to have 
Also, essential fats are critical. They say you got to take fish oil and eat salmon and all this garbage. I would not do that. I would get my girlfriend or partner on, you know, eating flax seeds every day, which I already do anyways, and also even supplement with the DHA supplements. Um, and I think other than that, I would want to have them basically ramp up their phytonutrient content through juicing. I would try to avoid eating, you know, like meaningless fruits. Well, I call them meaningless, but <laughs> bananas, you know, instead eat berries. So, you know, I'm able to, you know, provide that for my partner and make sure they're eating like the super highest nutrition so that they could be healthy, but more importantly for the child and make sure they eat lots of different greens and lots of different kinds of fiber. So important, right? It is shown in studies that, you know, the, the, the greater diversity of fiber you eat, including some things that may not be raw, just so that you can get them in you, you know, you're going to be healthy because of it, you're going to have a better microbiome, and more importantly, this is critical, that you will, the mama will pass the microbiome on to the child, and, you know, to so the child can have the strongest microbiome, so they have the strongest chance of being as healthy as possible. And that is somewhere, you know, where my mom, you know, uh, I got a little bit neglected because my mom gave me formula, so I didn't get the mother's breast milk, and, you know, I didn't get as much microbiome. Of course, breastfeeding, also very important. So uh, that's what I would say. And, I, you know, nuts, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I mean, I just basically eat, I'd eat like I'm eating now and maybe even up it up, make sure I got enough DHA and all the other nutrient requirements are met and focus on phytonutrients, focus on rich, colorful foods, and, you know, drink carrot juice instead of eat bananas. I have a video on that topic as well. And, you know, these, this is like carrot juice is infinitely more nutritious than eating some bananas. And actually carrots, uh, I, I get them actually for less money per pound than I do bananas <laughs> where I live. All right. Um, next question is from Trond Arl Toft. Do you know anything about vertical farming using aeroponics? If so, what's your opinion on it? Vertical farming versus regular farming. Is it the future of commercial agriculture? Well, some people may want you to think that vertical farming is the future because you can do it in a warehouse with lights and all these things. And, you know, I think it's novel and it's fun. And any way people could grow more food and they could get them interested in growing food, I think the better. But I think really the future of commercial agriculture is growing a permaculture system, non-monoculture, right? And, and, and employing labor. And actually the future of commercial agriculture is small localized farms, maybe even a farm on every block that just feeds your neighborhood or even a farm in a city that feeds a neighborhood instead of trucking food miles and miles and miles around the country. Maybe if you got a warehouse in the middle of Milwaukee to grow greens in the, you know, winter time, hey, that's great, that's better. But, you know, I think that, you know, we need to get back to basics and not get all these high-tech methods, you know. Hey, I love aeroponics, I love aquaponics and, you know, hydroponics, but it's just not natural. There needs to be a soil microbe root zone symbiosis and is basically a part of a whole larger system that probably people don't understand, including myself. And it's so critical to have the highest quality food. You know, aeroponics, not entirely totally natural. Although I, I have seen, you know, um, watercress like growing in a stream as water's running by it. So that's kind of like aeroponics, but not really because it's like that's growing with air versus water. So, uh, yeah, I don't think that's the future of agriculture myself. Um, maybe some people will make it that way, but I think it's very wasteful uh, the way it's done. Dinah Haneda asks, What are your thoughts on alternate fasting for women in their 30s? What do you recommend to break a 30 to 40 hour fast with? Thank you, John. All right, so I'm not a woman in their 30s, so I don't exactly know <laughs> what to do. Um, I do believe in fasting. You know, there are different kinds of fasts, and each of them have their pros and cons. I do intermittent fasting, 12 hours eating, 12 hours not eating. You know, to expand that, you could do 12 hour, 24 hours of eating or eat one day and then one day not eat. You know, um, as long as you're getting all your nutrient and calories need met, you know, on that one day to account for the second day, I don't see that to be an issue. But the other thing is, if you're just going to be running a regular job and working and going out of the house and not eating for the whole day, I mean... I would encourage people to be careful um, for a long fast, especially they should be supervised in my personal opinion. I think that'd be, you know, probably, it'd be probably better to do like, you know, a 16 hour fasting window and eight hours of eating or even try to bring that down further. If you're able, I was not able to do a 16, eight fasting. It just made my life too complicated, too hectic. So I do 12 and 12. Um, 
and then to break a long fast, I would break it with juice. Straight up, number one, juice. Some people might say watermelon juice. Some of them might say, you know, orange juice. I would try to do a mild juice, mostly vegetable based. So I'd do maybe lots of cucumber with a little bit of greens to kind of keep it like really light and watery. And then start off with that. And I'd probably do another secondary juice and then get into like eating fruits and then getting into eating vegetables. And then maybe for dinner, some nuts and seeds. But that's like getting pretty doggone regimented. <laughs> All right. Um, next question is from Melinda Golanski. How do you make natural K2 you talked about in your question and answer video? I'd like to know, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. I think a natural K2 should be better than store-bought vitamin supplements. Thank you. All right, Linda. So K2 is produced by bacteria, whether that's in like an animal, like in a cow's gut or whatever. Uh, the bacteria can make K2, then it goes into the cow, then you eat the cow or the other animal, and you get the K2. So that's getting it secondhand from the from the bacteria through the cow. Let's cut off the cow. We don't need to eat cows or other animals, in my personal opinion. Um, so bacteria makes it. So what I do, well, what I, I buy natto, but I, I could make it because I have the natto inoculant. But basically, you would cook soybeans, put in the natto inoculant, or put in some fresh natto in there and inoculate it and get it to ferment. The bacteria, as it's culturing or eating the soy or whatever uh, you know beans you're putting in there, will make the K2 as a byproduct. So actually, some of the supplements that you buy for K2 are actually made from natto, and they actually extract the K2 from it. Um, and some other, uh, you know, K2s are made different ways. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how they're made. So uh, my goal is to eat natto. I have videos on freeze-dried natto, so if you don't want to make it yourself, you could buy it freeze-dried, which is amazing because some people don't like natto because it tastes like whatever they say it tastes like. If you eat it freeze-dried, it's crunchy and more delicious. I just will eat it plain, which actually I should add some to my meal tonight because I haven't had it in a couple days, although I had the freeze-dried natto just a few days ago, and I even bought a dehydrated uh, natto, which actually I actually don't like so much. But yeah, all excellent ways to get K2. I think K2 is actually quite important, and it's something that most vegans or even raw foodists uh, you know, may leave out, although you know, supposedly we can make K2 on our own if we eat enough greens. I'm not the expert on that topic by any means, so I think why not eat it? It's not going to hurt me. <laughs> All right, next question is from Zhao Tu Tao Hui. <laughs> Hi, John, big fan. Is chopped and dropped moringa good for the soil? After collecting the leaves, can branches be chipped and used as mulch? Yes! <laughs> you could chop and drop anything, <laughs> and I would do that. And um, I would also encourage you to basically chop up or chip up the wood of the plants so that they break down and can basically degrade quicker and feed the soil faster. Of course, you could just chop and drop whole trees and it will break down over time, um, but I would like to get them broken up to the smallest particle size. Next question is from uh, Deepak Gutal. Hi, John, what are your current views on iodine supplementation? I've not seen you or Dr. Rick talk much about it. Is this something that raw vegans should consider seriously or are sea vegetables enough to meet our iodine needs? So yes, I have talked to Dr. Rick on this, uh, you know, not on camera, so I know his personal opinions and I have my own opinions as well. Uh, so I think, especially if you're a raw vegan and you're not eating any seaweed, I mean, then I would supplement personally. That's what I would do. I can't tell you, you guys what to do because I don't do that. But if I was not taking a seaweeds and different types of seaweeds, I would definitely supplement or minimally at least get tested. But that's a whole different conundrum if the testing is even accurate because everybody will say something different. You know, I eat seaweeds for my iodine. I just don't eat one kind of seaweed. I eat nori. I eat, you know, this. I eat that. I have so many different kinds of seaweeds from all over the world, which is amazing. I have seaweeds from, you know, Iceland. I have... You know, seaweeds from New Zealand, I have seaweeds from Japan, I have seaweeds from Korea, and I even have phytoplankton also has iodine in there, right? So, you know, I'm trying to cover my bases and all my different nutrients through a lot of different foods and not just eat one food. I rotate these foods and I don't eat like whole meals out of, out of you know, seaweed. I may add some seaweed in, you know, most of my meals, most days, you know, my, my current salad actually doesn't have any seaweed in it at all. Sometimes I'll put a powder mixed into the sauce. Sometimes I'll put whole seaweed chopped up. I was gonna add nori flakes um, to this, uh, to the last salad I make, but I forgot. But I'll be all right, because I eat you know seaweed on a regular basis. Small quantities and different types, more importantly, because each type of seaweed can concentrate more of different you know 
minerals, which may be good or bad, and so you don't want to get a buildup of any one nutrient too much, but you want to have enough. In addition, I supplement my soil with things like kelp and phytoplankton that contains iodine, so when I spray on my foiler feed of the uh, phytoplankton, my plants can now absorb the iodine, which is something most farmers simply do not do. Okay, so that's my uh, personal opinion on that. When I did do an iodine test, I did like an iodine spot test on my skin at some health seminar thing, and according to the person that was reading it said, I have sufficient iodine, I have not got any testing other than that, and I do want to do that. But I, I would like to think that I am probably all right in iodine. Um, you know, most people, if you're not eating iodine salt, which I don't do, definitely need to be concerned about where are you getting your iodine from because it is not in standard fruits and vegetables, even organic or even from your local farmer because most of the time they are not adding the things into the soil or to the plants that are going to add the iodine. So this could be a big issue. Next question is from Meg. Hi, John. How do you navigate family gatherings as a raw vegan? I come from a big southern family that always uses eating as an excuse to come together and I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings when I decline to eat what has been cooked. All right, Meg, so I'm not the best person to ask this question. I'm not the most social. I'm kind of anti-social, believe it or not, and I'm a big extreme introvert. Luckily, my family does not have huge gatherings. <laughs> but I have been to you know gatherings from my ex-girlfriend when we would have gatherings. And, you know, I'd navigate those just fine. I've been doing this a long time. So the one thing is, don't navigate it like I did the first time when I was newly raw and I went to a Thanksgiving dinner, you know, with my family and I brought a big salad to eat and I just was like mouthing off at people. How are you eating dead car animal carcasses and all this stuff? And don't do that. You're going to alienate yourself. So keep to yourself. And here's what I recommend. Bring a couple different dishes, you know, bring a big salad. Salads are easy, most people eat salads. Trying to make a crazy dressing, I make some crazy stuff and most people probably not like, might, might not like my, some of my weird things I make. So I try to keep it very simple, like a miso, miso tahini garlic dressing usually is a big hit at those kind of places um, I found. And just make a salad and then just bring some cut up fruit. Everybody loves fruit, everybody loves salads and bring those to share and if, if people aren't having if people aren't bringing food and everybody's provided, bring your own food and say, hey, I brought some of this for everybody. You know, and just stop at that. Don't get in along sermons or why you're doing this. And you know, um, and, if, and if anybody asks you like, why aren't you eating the other food? So just say, my doctor says I need to be on a special diet for my health. People usually don't question if you say your doctor and then find a doctor. I mean, there's online doctors and you know, um, you know, that, that says that, or just make it up. I would want to find a doctor and I, of course, have many doctor friends that told me I need to eat this way for my health, so I'm not lying, uh, you know, if that's important to you. So uh, that's what I would do personally, um, you know, and I would, you know, always, um, you know, say, oh, well, I'm not eating that, but I'm eating this. I brought this, and I want you, and then change, switch, flip the topic on them, you know, hey, I want you to try this. What do you think of what I brought? <laughs> Shut up. Don't try to convince them of nothing. <laughs> the most important thing. And then change the subject to something else besides food. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let's see here. Uh, Stephanie Jen Sick. What detox plan did you follow when commencing on the high raw train? I feel I have experienced difficulties thriving on a raw diet because of my bowel, but cleaning the bowel takes time and dedication before being able to thrive on a raw diet and eating enough calories. Did you experience any issues or have malabsorption issues? All right, Stephanie, so when I first got into raw, I number one, started juicing. I juiced for about six months straight while still eating regular foods. You know, I juiced basically in the morning for breakfast, and then I juiced in the afternoon, and that basically cut down to what I was eating by half, so I was really detoxing slowly through the juices. I then found a book called Cleanse and Pure Thy Thyself by Dr. Richard Anderson, um, which talks about colon cleansing, and I bought all his herbs and did this colon cleanse thing with water and his herbs. They say you can drink as much juice as you want. I didn't. I missed that part of the book the first time, so I just drank as much water as I wanted. So basically, water fasted with these herbs, like every one and a half hours, and psyllium bentonite shakes. Took that and had amazing results. And after that, I mean, I was good. I mean, probably for a long time, I had some malabsorption issues potentially because I would see things not as well digested when I would eat, and you know. Over time, that all basically disappeared on my specific raw vegan diet. Everybody's raw vegan diet is totally different. So basically what I'd say is that I'd say slowly work with your bowels and include, you know, more juices. That's an excellent way to help detox and, you know, maybe find some different herb and do some kind of herbal cleanse. 
but I don't think everything's about model absorption issues, although I do believe that so many people have some messed up guts from all the bad food and antibiotics and killing their microbiome off. I also do take some probiotic supplements as well as, you know, eat some fermented foods sometimes, but the majority of what I eat are fresh foods and the foods from my garden, if I pick them with minimal washing, will still contain plenty of beneficial microbes. Actually, I fermented wild rice and actually I poured the water on my lettuce here. So if I eat the lettuce, it probably has a lack of bacilli from the wild rice that I, uh, you know, bloomed the other day. Let's see here. Janelle J asks, has your libido changed over the years of being vegan? And I can say, no. I mean, my libido is pretty much the same as it always been. And I'm currently single, so it sucks. <laughs> so, all right, that's all I'm gonna say about that. So Jay asks, I'm trying to go 100% raw vegan for health reasons. What should I avoid in the raw foods while losing weight and eating raw? So yes, raw vegan is just one aspect and it just means you're not eating things that are heat processed and things that are not from animals. Although you could eat plenty of processed raw foods that are not gonna be um, you know, conducive to losing weight um, myself, in my opinion. So you wanna move away from high calorie foods. What are high calorie foods in a raw food style? Well, you could have raw oils. Oils are raw, because they can be cold pressed, although most of them are heat processed, but they're high calories. Other things that are high calories are, you know, things like extracted sugars. You know, they call, you know, like raw coconut sap or whatever. You know, all these things are, honey could be raw. That could be very high calorie because it's basically just sweetness. So we want to move away from things that are high calories on a raw food side, especially if you're trying to lose weight, you know. Um, dried fruits also, that's pretty high up there too. That's high in calories. And you know, if I'm having a bad day, I'll binge on dried fruit because it's high in calories and it's satiating. I'll feel good because of it, but it's not the best. And that's how I gain weight on my raw foods diet if I eat too many basically dried fruits. And then also nuts. You want to be concerned. Don't eat too many nuts. It's easy to start to handful of nuts and just keep chewing them up and mount them up. I have a video on why I only buy nuts or why it's best to buy the nuts in the shell. I'll post a link down below. That'll get you to slow down on the nuts, but you don't want to overeat nuts. So what you really should focus on losing weight is number one, the greens. You want to focus on leafy greens and vegetables, 100 calories per pound, whereas a teaspoon of oil is 120 calories per pound. Then you want to focus on fresh fruits. Fresh fruits are 300 calories a pound, approximately, depends on the fruit, and you know, it's full of water. So these foods will fill you up faster and you know, help promote better health and also weight loss at the same time. You know, so that's what I'd recommend. I'd recommend, you know, drinking juice every day to concentrate the greens. It's hard to eat a lot of greens, but if literally I could, I easily, you know, uh, juice, I don't know, 10 pounds of different kinds of, uh, you know, greens from my garden and also organic romaine and organic celery and organic cucumber and have nice big juices. Basically in a 32 ounce juice, I have basically four pounds of greens. So that could be only about maybe 400 calories approximately. Um, so yeah, that's what I'd recommend. You know, minimize the nuts and seeds, handful, and eliminate the oils and all the processed sugars on a raw diet. Stick with whole vegetables and fruits as much as you are able with small amounts of nuts and seeds and dried fruits if necessary, all right? Next question from Benedicto Torcampi. Can one build up bulk muscle on a raw vegan diet? And if so, would juices be a key factor to getting calories? All right, so I have many, uh, I have some friends that have actually built muscle on raw foods diet. It's not that hard. You need to make sure you get enough calories and enough protein, in my opinion, and the protein, we don't need protein powders. You do need to eat protein in the source of greens, which are the highest, one of the highest foods in protein. How do all the big, you know, strong, you know, elephants and, um, you know, giraffes, how are they so strong? They eat greens all day. Now, you're not going to sit there and eat greens all day. That's why I like to juice the greens and concentrate the greens to get those nutrients into me so that I could eat more greens than I normally would and, in, you know, increasing my phytonutrients, but also protein. Robert Cheek, he's a vegan bodybuilder, which then, you know, he, he, he eats a good percentage of raw. He is not all raw by any means, but he was bodybuilding on a standard junk food vegan diet, taking protein powders. And once he flipped over to eating whole food vegan diet, you know, he had better gains. So I would, how would I would do, do that even better? Well, I would start juicing the greens and I would make sure you eat enough fruit, right? You could juice fruits to concentrate that. I would prefer to eat fruits instead of juice them, although I do juice a few fruits in with my vegetables. But you need to get your calories if you're burning calories. So you need to get them from somewhere. So I like to juice my, you know, vegetables so I can increase my calories without increasing the fruits because the phytonutrients 
very important for muscle healing and for healing our bodies. And if you're just eating bananas to get your calories, calories are great, but we need those phytonutrients to rebuild and heal. That's why I think really it should be a green based diet personally, but I am not a bodybuilder. You know, I have decent muscles for what I am, but I don't, you know, um, you know, work out other than like lifting cases of, uh, you know, produce and lifting 50 pound bags of rock dust and worm castings and just getting regular exercise in my general day and gardening. Um, so yeah, I'd say, uh, so I guess probably the list would be focus on greens, um, juicing them, uh, eating fruits. If you need more calories, then I'd probably juice some fruits and then, you know, then make sure you get only enough nuts and seeds and don't overdo those guys because those will definitely slow down some of the processes. But you want to make sure you get enough and don't forget about your omega-3s. But if you're eating enough greens and fruits and you're not eating nuts, then you probably will have perfectly fine omega-3 to 6 balance. Next question is from Auth. Dear John, what are your thoughts on proprietary plant breeding rights and trademark fruits and vegetables? Should we be eating these varieties and should we be growing these fruits and vegetables? Can you comment on this issue, John, as they incur royalty payments if the growers attempt to grow them and are pre prevented from propagating these varieties, non-viable seeds, the public denied purchase of the seeds, etc. In reference to the legal stance and patenting and commodification of these varieties. My example is the tomato tomato, a patented hybrid by the agribusiness Syngenta, now owned now under the ownership and control of China National Chemical Corporation, ChemChina. Please offer your thoughts on these issues. Cheers. All right, off. So that's a good question. So number one, I believe in um, plant breeding. I think that's really good. I like how plant breeding has happened in nature for millions of years. And I'm not a big fan of patenting life, okay? That's just straight up number one. Number two, I do not believe in GMOs. So if any of these things that are patented are GMOs, I do not believe in those myself personally because that's making things that would just not happen in nature. We're talking about proprietary plant breeders rice where they basically cross all these tomatoes and get this one cool tomato and now uh, they 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 keep that those seeds and these are our seeds if you want to grow you got to pay us royalties and you can't sell it so that they have a you know they have a, an edge on the market because they have this special tomato that nobody else has you know so I guess it depends on what are the properties of the tomato or, or the fruit or vegetable, right? So for me, I buy tomatoes when I'm able. I usually don't pay full price for them. I only usually get them when they're like a buck a pound, which is a good deal. <laughs> and they're hot house grown, so I don't have to worry about like excessive spraying or pesticides on there, in my opinion. Um, so why do I buy those? But John, they're patented and all this. Well, I'm glad somebody could make money. I'm glad, number two, they're actually growing it because tomatoes are higher in anthocyanins than basically other tomatoes you could find in the store. So, you know, when I'm not growing tomatoes in my garden, which is most a lot of the year, I'm buying the tomatoes of the most nutritious tomatoes, and I'm glad that they have them. I'm glad they went through the process of growing them, and I'm glad they have some protection on that so that they can continue to do that and being unhindered, right? So I'm glad that that happens. You know, I'm, I'm still not a fan of patenting life and then keeping all these things, but here's the thing, right? Unless you're gonna try to start a commercial business and try to like, you know, grow those seeds and sell it to people, if you get some tomatoes and then grow those seeds out, they're going to make some tomato plants. You may get fruits like the tomato or not. If you do that in a succession like six times, seven times, you're going to get the genes to stabilize and you may have your own open pollinated heirloom tomatoes that's totally different than theirs. And then that's, I think that's totally fine, but you got to check with a lawyer to make sure because now you, you've created something else, your own plant breeding by crossing you know their seeds because you don't have their exact seed it's totally different genetics and and you know i don't think most farmers that have patented plant rights would really be upset at a home gardener if you're not making a big deal and you don't tell anybody you're growing it but that's just me i don't think they're going to send out drones to find that guy's growing tomatoes in his backyard <laughs> you know personally so should we be eating these varieties you know that's up to you that's a personal decision i choose to eat high nutrient varieties of course some varieties that are grown for pat for patented purposes are grown for certain reasons maybe it's grown because it stores better maybe it's grown because it ships better maybe it's grown because you know it doesn't go bad after you know you drop it like a lot of tomatoes out there these are not good reasons for me to want to buy and support these products the reasons for me that i would support a product that's trademark or patented is because it's higher in phytonutrients and they're going to give me benefits that I cannot obtain other places. Of course, if you're going to grow your own, I don't encourage you guys to grow those plants. I encourage you guys to grow open pollinated and heirloom plants 
in your garden. I grow plenty of F1 hybrids in my garden. Some of these are, and I don't know which ones are, because frankly, I don't really care as long as it's not a GMO, even if it's hybridized and maybe not, you know, uh, made through natural selection and heirloom, as long as it has, you know, nutrition and it's, and I'm gonna eat it. I think the bigger issue with the patented plants is that most of these patented plants are grown conventionally, not organically, and that's a bigger issue at hand that I would have with the plants. So, you know, my goal is to not eat conventional produce, you know, unless it's something that's gonna limit my diet dramatically and I can't get the item organic. And also I try to ensure that the things I eat that are not organic are very low spray or have low residual spray and have the least amount of, um, you know, um, risk to eating them, all right? And then of course, wash them uh, really well. Last question is from Ryan O'Neill Seaton. Your friends, the Adventists, are of the view that uh, vegetables should be steam cooked down. What do you think? All right, so number one, I don't know how my the Adventists are my friends. Maybe some Adventists watch me. I think, hey, whatever religion you are, that's great. Um, I don't necessarily know any Adventists specifically that are my friends, although they do a lot of studies on Adventists from Loma Linda, which, is, which I'm quite thankful for, so we can see actually what happens. You know, everybody has their own opinion and views on things. And, you know, my personal opinion is that, you know, greens especially, we want to consume them as raw as possible, right? Um, you gain more from the raw fruits and vegetables, especially the vegetables, if you can consume them raw than if you can cooked, um, for the most part, depending on how you process them. So, for example, if you, if you don't eat greens because you don't like them and you cook them down, absolutely do that because that's better than not eating greens. Absolutely. I totally agree with that, right? If you can pick greens and eat them as a salad, you know, that'd be my preference over eat, cooking them, um, but make sure you chew them up really well. Some people can't handle chewing up and eating greens because it'll upset their system because they're not used to eating greens and live greens and because it has, you know, some, maybe some extra fiber in there that you're not used to. You know, my goal is to harvest the bottom leaves that are thick, that are more fibrous, and I harvest little baby inner leaves that are small for eating. They're a lot more tender to eat for me personally. I will also blend them up, which breaks down the fibers under vacuum so I don't lose some of the valuable antioxidants and other compounds in there, such as the, some of the polyphenols. Um, so, you know, there's pros and cons of every method, right? Um, I, actually, the best method for me to, to get the nutrients out of the greens for me is to juice them. You know, there's been a study where they show juice carrots um, you know, you had two times as high levels of beta carotene in your blood than eating those same carrots whole, whether cooked or raw. What people don't understand is that when you cook something, that's a process. When I juice something, that's a process. When I chew something up, that's a process. In every different kind of process, you will lose something, right? Juicing, what do you lose? You lose mostly insoluble fiber, and you're not getting maybe 100% of the nutrients, but you're getting like a, a good 90 plus percent of the nutrients in there, right? That makes it easier to digest, easier to absorb, especially most people aren't able to deal with the insoluble fiber. Now, juicing does keep the soluble fiber, and the percentage depends on the fruit or vegetable that you are juicing. For example, pineapples have 10% soluble fiber, so when you juice pineapples, that's not a good idea in my opinion. Um, although when you juice something like uh, carrots or jicama, I think that's about 50% soluble, 50% insoluble fiber. So you're gonna still keep some of the fiber. So I, I would rather break down the fiber extract the nutrients through juicing, so I'll get a greater uptake of some of those valuable carotenoids, as proven by science, as well as other nutrients. And, you know, juicing's a process, you lose some fiber, whereas cooking, if you cook something, you know, especially at high heat, you're gonna create toxins in it. You know, even if you're just stealing or cooking it down, if you're cooking it in water and boiling the leaves, you're gonna lose minerals in the water, so you might wanna drink the water, that's why I juice it. In addition, when you heat process things, you're losing antioxidants and polyphenols. They are actually going down because of it. So you're losing nutrients, creating toxins, um, and losing minerals in, in, many, in many ways that you do heat process foods. And you're losing all the enzymes. Enzymes are important, and especially with kale, they're extremely important because here's the thing. If I took this kale, and I take the kale, and I just basically put it in my pressure cooker and cook it up and eat it, right, I am missing significant anti-cancer benefits from the kale because I did not let the enzymes that are existing in the kale interact with the other properties in the kale. So for example, if you just uh, cook the kale whole 
raw, you would lose the anti-cancer benefits. But if you chew the kale up or you juice it, you will get the anti-cancer benefits of uh, the kale. Now, in a recent episode I have on my gardening channel, I'll post a link down below to that, I actually heat process the kale and I don't just take it and harvest it and put it in the pressure cooker. I chop it up finely to basically ensure that the enzymes are mixing in there, um, you know, amongst itself so I make it more a powerful anti-cancer food. This is also true with um, onions, so why you should pre-cut onions and your cruciferous vegetables before cooking if you do choose to cook them. You know, my parents won't eat things raw. They don't like it raw, so like I'm glad they eat it cooked because that's better than nothing, right? So you gotta take what you could get. So yeah, so for me, you know, if I could eat a food raw, I'm gonna eat it raw because I believe that'd be more beneficial if it's properly processed, very important. Even blending, blending destroys phytonutrients, you know, and that's why I don't use a traditional blender. I only use vacuum blending and I use slow juicing. And of course, I use my mouth to chew things up, my teeth, which is basically a working at a low RPM to maximize my, my nutrition. And that's what basically all, all about. Probably uh, many people might think I'm weird, but this is the way I live. And this is what I've learned over the many years. And I'm glad to share that with you guys. So thanks for the, those of you guys that have stick to the end. Anyways, if you guys enjoyed this episode, hey, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Also, be sure to share this video with somebody else that you guys could think it could help. Also, be sure to check that subscribe button right down below so you don't miss out on my new upcoming episodes that come out every five to seven days. And make sure to click the bell so you get notified as they come out. By the way, be sure to check my past episodes. The past episodes are wealth of knowledge. Over 600 episodes at this time on this YouTube channel dedicated to teach you guys all about how to eat the healthiest plant-based fruit and vegetable dominated raw diet on the entire planet in my personal opinion. <laughs> um, if you have a question for, for next time, click the link in the description to my comments page and submit your question there. And until then, I look forward to uh, talking with you next month when I do another Q&A. So with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best.